Hey everyone, uh, before you watch this video, I just want to let you know it's not a chill documentary like most of my stuff. Uh, it's an opinion piece about something that frustrates me, and a pretty opinionated one. Uh, it's not supposed to be 100% accurate, and there's a little bit of yelling and swearing and throwing things in the back half, so if those vibes are upsetting, I won't mind if you skip this one. This is the HP CapShare 920, and we're not here to talk about it. We're not here to talk about my split lip either, but we'll see how that goes. We need this to get where I want to go though, so we'll set that aside and start with a bogus question. Who do we have to thank for the car? I mean, the obvious first step, Google, who invented the car? It's Carl Benz. There's your answer. If you want to take the long view, uh, you can go on to say, well, many other people worked on designs over a long period, slowly crystallized into what we have now. And that's all very true. But you could also just say Henry Ford, and I think that's true too. He didn't invent the car. Hell, the thing he was most well known for doesn't really resemble anything we drive now but he put them in everyone's driveway and that's what matters, right? The car as we know it, as a machine that an enormous number of people can afford to own and operate, something that's culturally ubiquitous. That started with the Ford Motor Company by most perspectives and that's more relevant in most conversations than who invented something. And there's a lot of other things whose inventor we could debate, but what I find fascinating is what does and doesn't get the honor of a colloquial history at all. Uh, some things we don't know or care or discuss who invented them or even who popularized them, even stuff we use every day. One example is the optical mouse. I think these were revolutionary, or more accurately, I think the ball mouse was a crime against humanity. I mean, they're just terrible. It was a miserable idea. It was the only computer peripheral that was, without question, dirty. It's full of literal dirt at all times, no matter how clean your environment was. You know, were these really all that bad? Yes. <laughs> I say they are. The fact that I ever had to clean one of these is stupid. And I knew that when this was current technology. I hated the ball mouse by the time I was conscious and I celebrated my first optical one, which looked a lot like this. It turned a finicky, filthy device into one so clean and reliable that you could go 10 years using the same one with no maintenance without ever paying it a second thought. Now we all benefit from this tremendously, but the question of who invented it doesn't come up. I never heard anyone talk about it. You can feel free to Google it, but I think the answer you'll get is useless and misleading. Google says it was Xerox, and I think that's even more wrong than saying it was Carl Benz. So let's get out in front of that. Uh, the first known optical mouse was invented in 1980 at Xerox by one Richard F. Lyon, and I talked about it in a video about a different mouse a while back. It was a successful product. It was sold with Xerox and Sun workstations. People were using them in the early to mid 80s to do their jobs, and I don't care, and that doesn't matter. Because by the history I've found, Xerox's accomplishment has nothing to do with us. It's not why I got to use optical mice like these for the last 20 years. In fact, even Richard Lyon himself later asserted that his mouse had been largely forgotten before being reinvented. And it took me a while to work out how that happened, but it turns out he was absolutely correct. We don't owe Xerox anything for this enormous improvement to computer usability. We owe Hewlett Packard and this failed product. How little can I say about this? It's from 1998, it's called the HP CapShare, and I just couldn't manage to make this video about it. I tried to care, but I don't. It's of no consequence, it was a flop, it was a one trick pony, and it's a trick we've already seen before because it's the predecessor in every sense to the Halo scanner mouse I reviewed a few months ago, and it does the exact same thing. Uh, the Halo was a 2010s design, and it works like this. You set it on a document that you want to scan. You slowly move it around, and a camera on the bottom takes pictures that are assembled into a larger image by keeping track of how you move and using algorithms to extrapolate how the photos fit together. That's a mouthful, but I'm rolling some footage. It's probably pretty obvious what's going on. The CapShare does the same thing, and the only real difference is that instead of a conventional camera, it uses a linear sensor, uh, like you'd find in like a flatbed scanner. It can only capture one line at a time. It's also black and white, and it doesn't need to be connected to a PC to operate, but otherwise it's the same thing, and it's not very remarkable. But how it works is, or more accurately, the fact that it works exactly the way the Halo mouse would 15 years later. I thought that Halo was interesting mostly because of how simple it was. Uh, the imaging was done with a webcam sensor, uh, the final picture was computed in software, but most of the magic came from two ordinary optical mouse sensors on the bottom of the device that tell the software exactly how it's moving and rotating. And the CapShare also uses a pair of optical mouse sensors, except that in 1998 those didn't exist and that's what this video is about. I'd love to leave it at that and just skip the demo, but you need to know what this thing's all about, so here. You put in two AA batteries. You turn it on, you set it on a document, you press the button on the back and it starts scanning. As you move it around, it builds up a picture in memory and as long as you keep it on the surface, it keeps scanning and you can capture a document of almost any size and shape you like. 
When you're done, it saves the scan internally and you can view it on the little screen on the back. It even lets you zoom in so you can make sure you got a good copy without needing to check on a computer. Although you can, of course, transfer your images to a computer. It only records in one bit black and white like a fax machine. Uh, this is what a good quality copy looks like. It's crisp, copes pretty well, varied tones. It looks like a great product. I bought it hoping it was, but I was wrong. It sucks, it failed, and you haven't heard of it for a reason. There's nothing this is good at that a flatbed scanner doesn't do better. Not, not really. It seems like it should be more flexible. It should let you scan smaller items with less uniform surfaces and do it in unusual conditions, but it doesn't really deliver on any of that. It's well made, but it's just fragile in principle and impractical in practice. For one thing, it has no removable storage. There's no memory card you can pull out to move all your scans to your computer. You have to transfer them one image at a time to your PC. And since this came out in 1998, your choices for that were over serial or infrared, both of which were agonizingly slow. So even for the most basic tasks, the workflow sucked. And it also had the same problems that crop up every time someone tries to make a handheld scanner. I think there's something about the concept that makes it seem like a great idea to people like you and me. I really want one of these that works well. I always have. And I think we picture it being lightweight, convenient, flexible. We imagine taking it to the library and scanning pages out of books, but that's not really feasible and it really can't be. For a handheld scanner to work with a free-floating document, you need to slide it over the top without the sheet scooting around on the desk or the scanner tilting or twisting, which will distort the image. And you need a good couple inches of free space on all sides for the scanner to overlap onto the desk. So you can't do this without an immaculately clean, flat, and remarkably large expanse of free surface space. Who the hell has that? And if you want to scan a page from a book, well, Good luck. You're never going to get it all the way into the crease and the page is going to flex and twist because you don't have any way to hold it in place. It just doesn't work. And when you ask, how can we solve these problems? The answer is a flatbed. The glass platen, the weight on top, the head not touching the document. These design elements solve all those problems. And a flatbed doesn't need a clean surface. It'll work sitting at an angle on a top of a pile of literal garbage. There's a reason this is how we've scanned documents for over 60 years. And they aren't even that big anymore. I mean, they need a large platen, but the modern ones are the size of a medium coffee table book. They don't really weigh anything. They don't use much power. This one runs directly off USB. If someone would just make this with a built-in battery and a screen and storage, I would take it to the library. Hell, I'd use it in my car. God forbid you try and use the cat chair in your car because it's the pickiest piece of shit in the world. Like any other hand scanner, the cap share is hard to keep straight. It is impossible to use inside a book. It doesn't work on surfaces that aren't flat because these are all unavoidable problems because it's a bad idea that can't work and so the cap share cannot fix it. The only improvements it brings to the table are that you can rotate it up to 45 degrees without distorting the image and you can scan things larger than a normal flatbed could handle. And you know, if that's what you need, then maybe this is useful, but for most people, it isn't really worth the trade-offs, since in a lot of other ways, it's inferior even to other hand scanners. The late 80s Logitech ScanMan, for instance, used a rubber roller to keep track of how you moved it, and that could be pretty janky, but this is worse. The CapShare's optical sensors are designed to stop scanning if they sense that you've picked it up. Well, if your document isn't a completely flat item on a completely flat surface, one or the other sensor will pop off an edge or lift up a little, and it'll get confused and give up on the scan. You don't get an opportunity to try again, like with a scan man or even the halo mouse, it just gives up and your scan is ruined. My roast is ruined. This means that scanning books isn't just impractical, it's impossible, because you can't fit both sensors onto a page in most books, and even if you do, they'll inevitably slide off the edge at some point. I was able to get part of a page out of Vagabond, for instance, and you can see that it would have looked great if it had finished, but it gave up when one end slid a millimeter off the side, which was totally unavoidable, and that's with a larger than usual book, a typical paperback, out of the question. Now I admit that doing this on a flatbed can be awkward too, but if you don't mind bending your book a bit, it's doable instead of impossible. And there are better solutions, like the book edge scanners that the Seattle Library offers. A portable version of one of those would be totally feasible and it would solve all these problems. And the cap share has even more issues. Uh, for instance, it can't scan anything reflective, like the uh, box that it came in. And that's not because it can't pick up the image. It gets a great picture, but after a couple seconds, the reflection confuses the sensors and it gives up. There's no adjustments, there's no overrides, and you can easily end up with a dozen partial scans as you struggle to capture something that a flatbed would breeze through. So this is not, like I had imagined when I ordered it, a better version of the Halo mouse from a more enlightened era when we put more effort and forethought into things. In fact, I'd say the Halo, when it worked, was superior. 
They don't make them like they used to is sometimes a good thing. Very few genuinely novel products in the last decade have been as poorly thought out as some of the spaghetti that was thrown at the wall in the 80s and 90s. So as a scanner, this really isn't noteworthy since it barely works. And even if it did, it was part of a world that didn't include most of us and never would have. There was this explosion of handheld computing in the mid 90s, this uh, new era where you could sit in a room with other people authoring documents on pocket sized devices and using ad hoc networking to send them to each other with no cooling fans or cables, no ever present Wi Fi or LTE, and none of it mattered. Almost nobody really cares that any of that happened. The Palm Pilot and the Pocket PC and all that stuff didn't change the world. They were used almost entirely by yuppies and all those product lines died. Their lineage ended and nothing of them remains in anything we use unless you want to nitpick about this patent or that or who invented what first or about how some Palm engineer built on a concept 10 years later at Danger Inc or whatever because we would have gotten here anyway. The relatively few people who had Palm Pilots remember them vividly and everyone else feels that the personal device revolution started in 2007 when the iPhone came out because that's when it first started to affect people who weren't businessmen. And the iPhone would have existed without the Palm Pilot because the idea is obvious. The defining features are fits the human hand and has a screen and we didn't need prior art to get there. The cap chair was part of that world. I'm sure it was impressive to see in action if you got to see it. If you could afford to spend $600 on this single purpose gadget, then you could go to the library, scan some old newspapers, go home, beam them wirelessly to your IR enabled printer and get perfect reproductions with no PC involved. Bring it with you on a business trip, scan your receipts, catalog them in your Palm Pilot. It's a very utopian future, but I imagine very few people ever got to see it. And the cap share could not have changed history from inside that market segment. But the sensors on the bottom did because they left that market segment. They revolutionized a common product that everyone used, which was embarrassingly obsolete and insulting to our dignity, but they weren't even meant to do that. They were invented only to make this device work, and we know this because we have an interview with the inventor, one Travis Blaylock, who the Computer History Museum interviewed some years ago. I emailed them for permission to use that interview, and I never got a response, but then I decided that I think it's fair use, so hopefully that goes well. Here he is. Uh, after that came the handheld scanner project, which, led to the optical mouse. Uh, and so Ross Allen in the printing technology department, he formed a little ad hoc group called the new couch potato office of the future task force. You know, if you had no pockets or backpack or anything else, what would be the one or two sort of handheld devices you would really want to have? If you want the whole story, you can get a transcript on their website. I've linked that in the video below. Blaylock and friends were coming up with self-contained portable devices, just free associating new ideas. And he was asked to think of a way for a handheld scanner to know how it was being moved in two dimensional space. Using uh, imaging and cross correlation to, to, to measure movement over, over surfaces, paper in particular. His idea was to make a camera that looked at a tiny part of the paper underneath it, found some details in the fibers and kept track of how their positions changed to calculate how the device must have moved in the real world. There are these two little optical navigation modules and these tracked position as the scanner moved in a freehand across, across the paper. We were actually navigating on the texture of the paper. That is exactly how an optical mouse works, and it's easy to assume that he adapted the principle from Xerox into a consumer product. But he didn't, and we know that for a fact. Earlier in that interview, he mentions that he came up with the idea while talking to a guy named Bill Holland, and CHM also interviewed him. In Bill's interview, he explains that he accidentally stumbled on the idea of correlation-based surface tracking when he was working on some unrelated projects years earlier. That involves serendipity. It was uh, the, the right things came together that uh, produced the technology uh, in, that, that resulted in the optical mouse. When we were developing the color scanner, uh, we realized that there were some non-uniformities in the, in the CCD sensor. It was, became obvious that although white paper looks white to human observers, if you look down at the, at the fine level, you're seeing the, the structure of fibers in the paper. And then while working with Blaylock, he passed on the idea. They described to me a little bit of the work that Bill Holland and John Ertl had done in using uh, imaging and cross correlation to, to, to measure movement over, over surfaces. Uh, Bill Holland, John Ertl had done that nice work. And so I thought, well, that would probably allow us to track motion. So Blaylock integrated Bill Holland's prior work with his ideas and developed the cap share, which ended up being a flop, but he was working with another person, one Gary Gordon, who CHM also interviewed. Gary picked the ball up and ran with it, pun intended. 
Now, to be fair, at first he was laboring under the common 90s misconception that TV was going to become interactive. So his goal was actually to make what we would now call a gyro mouse, uh, which you could use to control a cursor in midair. I thought that at one point that the t television set and the computer were going to converge. Gary Gordon, he came by and he wanted to do initially this uh, flying mouse is what we called it. It looked out into the room and you could wave this thing around and it would move a cursor. Uh, Gary was thinking about uh, interactive TV applications. But that turned out to be a silly idea. I was not correct on that. Uh, and then Gary also became very interested in turning it into a mouse. It turns out that long before any of this nude couch potato nonsense, Gary Gordon had already been thinking about applying optical technology to a mouse. And not because he'd seen Xerox's product, he'd just seen a problem that needed solving and he already knew how to solve it. I think for several years before I used their mechanical mice and was constantly aggravated and they would get dirty and with aggravation people would slam them on the table and blow on them and so forth. I used this on a wood surface and I thought for many years that it should be optical because I had um, seen image uh, target tracking in the Navy. I had, had studied um, correlation at Stanford. Gary Gordon saw a gap that it sat unfilled for far longer than it had any right to. An obvious problem that people had been irritated by for over a decade, but nobody ever buckled down and tried to solve it. He had figured out how to fix it years earlier, and then suddenly, and incidentally, he was in possession of the technology to create that solution. And there were projects around HP that actually, there was a scanner, that a handheld scanner, that looked at its position by using optical scanning. So I thought, you know, we'd make an optical mouse. Xerox had nothing to do with it, and that makes sense because in the 17 years prior, nothing had happened with their idea. It hadn't made any headlines. I wouldn't be surprised if none of these people at HP had ever used one since they were almost exclusive to specialized $20,000 computers. And as far as the design itself, it wasn't even really the same thing. Those Xerox mice weren't designed to work on arbitrary surfaces. Their sensors only had a four x four resolution, not nearly precise enough to work on paper or wood or even a normal mouse pad. You were supposed to use them with a special pad with a special dot pattern on it. And if that pad got dirty, it would actually quit working until you replaced it. They came in uh, pads. If it got dirty, you could tear it off and there's oh, another one. It's a piece of paper. Or you could tape it on your desk or whatever and each page had the reorder number on it so you can order more if you need. <laughs> I've heard that in practice they would sometimes work on other surfaces, but that's incidental. They weren't supposed to. They were supposed to be used in clean, controlled, institutional environments with purchasing departments and janitors. Nowhere I've ever been. The cap share, on the other hand, was supposed to get thrown in your briefcase, go on a plane, go to some construction site, capture a copy of a filthy contract on the spot on whatever surface was available, so it had to be tougher. Its sensors used a higher resolution, about 32 by 64, and much more sophisticated signal processing, and that made them a lot more flexible. For all my complaining about what the cap share can't do, it does manage to scan random pieces of paper on a relatively clean desk with remarkable consistency, and that is the thing it's designed to do. I think my complaint stands because it could have done a lot more, but for what it's doing, these sensors are excellent, and that's why they were prime candidates for a mouse once someone had the idea to put them there. When they were done with it, the CapShare's navigation chip had been turned into a general market mouse sensor called the Agilent HDNS 2000, Agilent being HP's semiconductor division at the time. It was also called the H2000 for short, and that's exactly how you'll find it labeled if you open up this. The Microsoft IntelliMouse with IntelliEye from 1999, the world's first optical mouse. And I mean exactly that. This is the first optical mouse because fuck Xerox. I'm mad as hell at them for never commercializing their product in a way that mattered. If you say that Xerox invented the optical mouse, well, that's bullshit, isn't it? Because it doesn't really do us justice. They invented something, but in 17 years, it never helped me. It never made it onto any of our desks, and they had plenty of time to put it there. I mean, they licensed the design to Mouse Systems, who produced a PC version. It got mentioned in a couple magazines, but if it sold more than a couple hundred units, I'd be shocked. I've never seen one except on eBay. Never seen it mentioned anywhere, in fact, until I went looking for one deliberately. And that's probably because, uh, in addition to still requiring the funky mouse pad, it also cost over $300. Xerox sold mouse systems their 1983 design. They didn't bother taking this monumentally important concept any further. They didn't develop it into something simpler and lower cost, more flexible, that could actually be sold to normal computer users. And nobody else was going to try if they were worried about having a slap fight over the IP with a massive litigious corporation. So I think Xerox screwed us. We could have had these all along. I don't know if Apple knew about Xerox's product. I think if they did though, the Mac would have shipped with one, cost be damned, because there's nothing elegant about a ball. 
And even after the Mac shipped, uh, even at that $300 price point, Xerox could have sold their product unaltered to the people with enough money to buy Apple's little graphical workstations. And their marketing would have worked a lot better than mouse systems now, if that had happened, then when mice came to the PC, the ball design would have been regressive, inferior, cheap. There would have been a race to produce an affordable optical design. And by the time I was conscious, they would have been commonplace. But instead, well, I composed 95% of the script on a Mac Color Classic, and I was using the ball mouse that it still would have shipped with in 1993. And it reminded me how miserable it was growing up with these things. I spent the whole goddamn time astonished that we put up with them. How many years did we spend suffering with ball mice only to find out that they were obsolete even before the first fucking Macintosh came out, before any normal person, not a college professor, any regular Joe had even heard of a mouse at all? Microsoft's product director in 99 actually made the same point. He said, can you imagine using a computer designed in 1968? Yet we think nothing of using 30 year old mice. The microwave oven existed in the mid forties in some government lab. I don't care. Raytheon sold it to restaurants in the fifties. I don't care, it's the Amana radar range that interests me. It's the thing that put this technology in thousands and then millions of homes. That's where my thoughts go. That's what changed the world, not from a trickle down perspective, but when every person got to lay their hands on it and use it to shape their own life, that's what I think about. You do you. I don't give Xerox a lick of credit for doing nothing to improve the state of computing for everyone. Richard Lyon did his best to contribute to humanity and the corporation he worked for decided not to bother letting us enjoy the fruits of his labors. So I say, Ah, shit, where'd I put the Microsoft one? So I say, this is the world's first optical mouse. Not the first one you could use in a university computer lab or a particle physicist's office, but the first one that the world knew about, that the world got to appreciate, that the world got to benefit from. This is it, it starts here at HP. Or at least, we know that. At the time, you thought it started at Microsoft because for some reason, they got all the credit. When Microsoft announced this, uh, it came out of nowhere. They just said, here it is, an optical mouse, enjoy. I didn't know HP invented it until two days before I wrote the script and I tried and tried and I couldn't find anything in contemporary media that ties Microsoft or the IntelliMouse or IntelliEye back to Agilent or HP. I couldn't find any magazine articles talking about the new wave of optical mice. So no opportunity for any columnists to offhandedly mention their involvement. I've scoured Microsoft's website from back in the day. They have pages about the technology, how it works, how clever it is, but none of them quite say where it came from. They don't quite say they invented it. They don't quite say anybody else did. I've looked for patent citations in their manuals. I've read press releases, but nowhere is it mentioned that Microsoft did not come up with this idea. Somebody who edited Wikipedia knew about the connection, but their one citation is actually invalid. The source doesn't mention this at all, and I can't find any primary sources that do. It actually tripped up my research because for a couple of days, I was trying to find Microsoft's patent to trace backwards from, and they don't have one. I mean, of course not, it's not their invention. They didn't bring anything to the table except a plastic case, which harkened back to the days of cereal mice and a name that they pasted over HPs. When I finally found the patent, it was of course held by HP. And in fact, I could have found it months ago because it's actually referenced in the patent for the Halo scanner mouse, along with HP's own patent for the exact same thing. Uh, their design works pretty much the same way, except it uses a pair of linear sensors instead of a webcam, same concept though. And did I mention that patent was filed in 1998 at the same time as the ones for the cap share and the optical mouse itself? All these ideas were clearly organic ones. They all fell together rapidly all at once. As soon as this optical navigation technology occupied the same room as a bunch of skilled engineers full of imagination and no preconceptions about what the future could hold. All these things float around in your head as I, I told you, I, I, you know, military tracking, um, correlation at Stanford. You know, I think in your head, these things just kind of come together and you realize that, you know, I should have, I should have thought of this years ahead of time. So it's, you know, it's typical what something's invented for doesn't necessarily uh, mean that's where its primary use is going to end up being. Uh, could, could be different. And yet HP decided not to implement or take credit for any of it themselves, inexplicably. They built the cap share, this weird niche gadget for nobody, but they never bothered making a mouse scanning or otherwise, despite it obviously being an enormous mass market product. HP was making computers, they were making workstations in 1998, but they didn't make an optical mouse to sell with them. Why? Why let Microsoft steal their thunder? They could have sold billions. Yeah, it ended up in, you know, hundreds of millions of optical mice. They sold about a billion of them. 
The only reference to this partnership that I can find with all my resources was an obscure page from HP's website, specifically about Gary Gordon, so you'd never have found it, in which they mentioned that he's partnering with Microsoft to license this tech under the name MouseJet, a brand that they carefully threw in the trash and buried. Oh, thank you for the trademark. We don't need anything like that, though. We'll use our own. It's particularly funny because uh, the next year, Apple produced their own optical mouse, uh, the Pro Mouse, uh, which also used the Agile H2000. You can see it right through the case. I'll put a little close up on the screen here. It's the same exact chip, and they also made absolutely no mention of where they got it, not in their press releases, not in their ads, not even in the white paper they produced to explain why their mouse was better than the unnamed competition. They just said, yep, here's ours. It's improved, as if this technology was years old and commonplace. They introduced no special trademark name. They didn't focus on the cleverness of the technology itself. They just dropped their product on the market like there was nothing to say, like optical mice were just normal now, like they didn't want to discuss it. For some reason, it seems almost like there was a conspiracy to conceal the inventor, and I would say the invention of the optical mouse. It's as if they simply appeared and nobody wanted to talk about where or who they came from, as if they'd always been around. And I don't understand that. I found them revolutionary completely obsolete the mechanical mouse in, in a matter of a couple of years. Did nobody but me notice how much better these were? I mean, sure, the early ones had their problems. I don't dispute that. To be honest, when I got these, I hooked them both up and I was shocked at how poorly they tracked. I hadn't used first gen optical mice in almost 23 years. And I admit, I didn't remember that they lost their way so easily. A pretty gentle shove will make both of these mice freak out. And that was not great for gaming in particular. And the reviews from the time point this out. So yes, at first these were not a perfect replacement. I get that, but they got better rapidly. And I still recall being astonished at how much better my first one performed than anything I'd used before. And to this day, anytime I end up having to use a ball mouse, even briefly, it's just infuriating. So personally, I find it surprising that we don't celebrate these, that we don't talk about where they came from. Nobody seems to really care about the mouse, except in the context of companies like Xerox, and then only because of their early history with the graphical user interface, because it's such a heavily discussed and documented subject that tons of people are interested in, in every aspect of it. Xerox's involvement with the mouse, optical and otherwise, gets swept up in our fascination with the birth of the GUI itself in the late 70s. So anything that was going on at the time is worth discussing, but who wants to talk about the fascinating things going on in computing in 1998? Outside of the glory days of early 3D acceleration, I feel like that's where people start tuning out, as if Windows 95 came out, so history's ended, we're just mopping up and settling in for the long haul, right? There's nothing worth mentioning, but big stuff was still happening, stuff worth remembering accurately, and I think that's what I've done. I hope you agree. Uh, if so, then consider subscribing to my channel. It helps me know I'm getting things right, or at least people think I am. Remember to turn on notifications if you want to know when I upload new stuff, because it's kind of getting irregular these days. But if you really like what I'm doing, then consider supporting me on Patreon, like all these folks are doing. I couldn't afford to do this without them, uh, because of you know my studio here, but also things like this mouse, which I had to jump on when it popped up on eBay for $40, even though the next day I found one locally for three bucks. But I gotta do what I gotta do, and sometimes that means spending more than I'd like on a video, uh, and all my patrons make that possible. So thank you all so much. I couldn't do this without you and everyone else. Thanks for watching.